Okay. Come on in. There's some seats up front. <laughs> um, so I hope everyone appreciated the terrible pun that I included in my title. I am shedding light on an understudied environmental factor, that environmental factor being light. So <laughs> I just had to. I couldn't help it. Um, so anyways, the question here is, though, how does light impact cisco, eggs, and larvae? And this question stemmed from the bigger question of how does climate change impact cisco? And so before we dive into that question too much, for those of you who, who didn't sit in on four other or three other talks on cisco, I'll talk a little bit about cisco. <laughs> so they are a native prey species to the Great Lakes that historically were once widespread and abundant but due to overharvesting and invasive species and habitat degradation, their populations are nowhere near where they used to be. Um, however, they fulfill a lot of really important roles in the Great Lakes, including an ecological role. Um, basically, at every single life stage, Cisco is consumed by some sort of or organism. And some of these organisms or predators also have an economic value. So like, like whitefish and lake trout and others, they are harvested for um, an ecological or an economic reason in the Great Lakes. And then Cisco themselves have become a popular source of caviar in Europe, so they also hold a direct economic role as well. So if we want to be conserving these ecological and economic roles, but in a population that is already depleted, we need to think about um, conservation and restoration, which is being done, which is great. But part of thinking about that is thinking about any negative implications that could uh, continue to drastically affect these populations. And of course, that brings us back to the big bag topic of climate change. Um, so climate change, though, is a pretty a broad topic. And so you kind of need to break it down and frame it in order to understand its context. Um, and our context is its impact on Cisco. And since we're specifically talking about the Great Lakes, we can zoom in on the Great Lakes. Sorry that the uh, lighting and coloring is a little different. Um, but we can even frame it a little bit more by thinking about climate change impacts during a certain time of year. So for Cisco, that time of year is winter. And why we are focusing on winter is because part of their life history, as a crucial part of their life history, is uh, spawning their eggs right in the early winter and having those eggs incubate and develop throughout winter, and historically winter includes ice, so that's foreshadowing to where I'm heading. But basically they also, their, their larvae tend to hatch out around ice out. So what we do know about climate change in the Great Lakes during winter is that unfortunately it means um, less ice. And so this is a cool GIF from Glural showing over the past 40 or so years the variability of ice coverage in the Great Lakes. And while there is variable ice coverage, so every time you see blue, that's zero ice coverage, and every time you see white, that means at some point that winter there was 100% ice coverage. Um, but that is variable, and overall there have been a couple papers showing that the ice coverage is definitely declining in all of the Great Lakes. So we can start to think again about what that means for Cisco, but first we'll start thinking about what reduced ice coverage means in general. and that includes changes in a couple different environmental factors, such as flow and light and temperature, and some of these have been alluded to in earlier talks. Um, and while temperature has been well studied, the effects of temperature on Cisco eggs specifically has been well studied and continues to be well studied. And flow is something that's up and coming, but it is getting some attention as well. That kind of leaves us with the environmental factor of light. And light impacts on fish egg development in general is pretty understudied, but in other organisms where light is studied on um, development of early life especially, it has been shown to change um, pathways in molecular processes or, uh, for example, if you've heard of circadian rhythm in birds, it, it tells your body when to turn on and off certain processes. And we also know that um, with snow and ice, you're getting very minimal light entering the water column, especially to some of these shallow depths where Cisco are spawning, such as Matt discussed in Lake Ontario, it's pretty shallow. So um, 
And then the, the other extreme here is no ice, where you can get the maximum amount of ice light entering the water column. So since there's such a drastic change from almost no light to light in the time that the Cisco eggs are developing, we think that there's potential for these, this light to be impacting their development. The question is, since it's understudied, the first question is, does light impact their development? And then if it does, how does it impact their development? So that brings us back to this question of how does climate change impact Cisco? But we've kind of taken that question and framed it a little bit more specifically to be, how does light impact Cisco eggs and larvae? And so we'll talk a little bit about my project, which is a pilot study to see the impacts of light on Cisco eggs. And so first of all, we, with the help of uh, New York DEC and Tunison, we collected some Cisco eggs we fertilized them, and then we drove them to the wonderful state of Vermont, where they were put in one of three treatments, a either 24-hour light treatment, a 24-hour dark treatment, or a regular photo period treatment that simulates the day-night cycle experienced by Cisco eggs in Lake Ontario, since these eggs were from Lake Ontario. And all other environmental conditions were kept the same. Temperature was the same, flow was the same, um, each each bin that they were reared in had uh, a light, kind of like, you can kind of see it in that picture on the far right, um, that controlled the amount of light that the Cisco eggs were getting. So everything was very controlled. And to understand some of these development and survival metrics, we had, uh, with the help of graduate student Taylor Stewart, we measured uh, weekly throughout egg development, different developmental assessments. Um, yolk sac measurements were taken, and then at the end of the period, uh, overall mortality was assessed as well. And then once the eggs hatched in the larvae, they were moved out of those light treatments and into a <laughs> consistent photo period treatment, since that mimics the ice melt off and back into a regular cycle. Um, and seeing if there was any long-term effects on the larvae due to these light treatments, light or no light treatments. And so after the larvae hatched, uh, length measurements were taken, there was also yolk sac measurements taken at hatch, and then mortality throughout the larval phase was also um, assessed. And so while these metrics can get of us an idea of how, how you know, broadly development might be affected or survival might be affected, we wanted to get a better or more thorough picture of what's going on here. So we decided to pair these techniques with uh, molecular techniques, and that's where I came in. So the molecular technique we decided to use is called a transcriptome. And using a transcriptome basically means that while you have a lot of genes present, you're only using a couple of them at once. And so by collecting the RNA present, because you take your DNA, um, RNA copies that and turns it into a protein, so basically, <laughs> by capturing just the RNA present, we're able to get at which genes are being expressed and then at what level they're being expressed since we're capturing all of the RNA present at a time. So here you've only got you know three out of the seven genes being expressed and we can identify which genes those are. And then we can also identify at what level they're being expressed because maybe in the dark treatment, they're showing one of these genes but at a low level of expression but then when you put it in the light treatment or you compare it to the light treatment, they are expressing that gene at a way higher level. So this is a pretty um, thorough technique that hopefully, well, it did give us a lot of great data. Um, so, but before we get into that, we'll talk a little bit about some of the observation results. Um, and those basically are that light decreases the incubation period. And so the, eggs reared in the light treatment hatched a full seven to eight days before the regular photo period treatment and the no light treatment. And so this right here, the x-axis is days post fertilization and the y-axis is proportion of hatched larvae. So we used when each tank reached 50% hatch as the metric for um, calculating this difference. Another observation that we saw was that the yolk sacs in the larvae at hatch in the light treatment were smaller compared to the other two treatments. And something else that's interesting to note here is that the yolk sacs 
in the no light treatment were the largest compared to the other treatments. So basically, they, Cisco eggs have their yolk sacs to feed on throughout egg development, but they also need some of that yolk sac left over to continue to feed on for the first two or so weeks after hatch, and that just helps them switch to exogenous feeding. And then finally, we saw higher larval mortality in the light treatment. So while egg mortality was similar for all three treatments, we definitely saw a pretty high mortality for the larvae in the light treatment. And so with just these results alone, you can maybe start to paint a picture of perhaps the small yolk sac size and the um, large amount of mortality in the, in the larvae could be linked. But we can also kind of get at that idea a little bit more by bringing in the transcriptome results. And so broadly, a, a transcriptome gives you a lot of great data, but you start with millions of reads. And reads are basically 150 base pair, base pair being like the A, the T, the Cs. So it's 150 segment of genes. And so first you gotta take those millions of reads, compile them back into transcripts, which can be kind of gene equivalents. And then you can start to get an idea of how these genes are being used. So with these millions of reads, we ended up with about 82,000 transcripts. And this is a PCA that shows some general, um, you can get an idea of how the genes might be expressed differently in treatment and life stage. So life stage is the shape of the icon and then the color, so the orangish color is the light treatment and the teal color is the dark treatment. And while you see some separation, there's not clear separation here. So we can take it one step further and start thinking about how these um, eight, you know, 80,000 or so transcripts are used. So thanks to many scientists before me, there are some wonderful databases out there where not only have they identified what these genes are, they've also gone to, um, they've done lots of studies to figure out what the function of those genes are. And so by putting our results into these databases, we can get an idea of what these uh, genes are and how they differentially express. And so first of all, we saw that there was some differential expression, so that just means that one gene was expressed in one treatment differently than it was expressed in the other treatment. And so this is just the number of differentially expressed genes and whether they were up or down regulated in response to light. Um, so we did see a lot more differential expression in the larvae compared to the eggs, but once you filter it through these resources that give you the function of these genes, you actually only get a handful because while the resources are great, um, the function of a gene in a fish might not be the same as a human, so we have to use only functions that have been annotated in similar species. But we still did see a little bit of functional enrichment, and that just means that certain functions popped up more <coughs> often, um, meaning that they're like not only one gene, but maybe multiple genes with that similar function were being used in the light treatment compared to the dark. So these results are for the eggs, and basically anything with a yellow box shows that there was a significant level of functional enrichment. And it's hard to read, and honestly, it doesn't make a lot of sense if you don't know the specific, like, all the specific pathways. But what's important here is that all of these link to metabolic processes. Um, and so if we take an example of one of these genes, and we'll use the BVRA, which is Billy Bearden Rebeckdase A, and I chose that gene because it was upregulated in eggs and larvae in the light treatment. So this means that this gene was at a much higher level of expression, expression compared to the dark treatment for both the eggs and larvae. And so it means they were using that gene more. So why are they using this gene more? What is that gene? And this is where we can start to look at the functional data that's available. And one of the functions of this gene is heme catabolism, which means as you break down your red blood cells, you're actually also gonna break down the different parts of the red blood cells, including, including hemoglobin. So here is the gene right here, and it just helps break down the parts of blood. So it's part of a blood breakdown chain. But it also has, so sometimes genes have more than one function, and BVRA also has a function in the insulin signaling pathway. And so it helps increase the uptake of insulin which also means that it helps increase the uptake of glucose and fatty acids. And I think this is important because this starts to 
make sense in the context of our other results. And so if we start to, again, these are just both metabolic pathways, um, meaning metabolic is kind of a, you know, a broad term that just talks about burning energy <coughs> in a lot of different ways and breaking things down. And so if we kind of take our transcriptome results and then we go back to those initial results, we can start to draw a couple conclusions. And the first one being that pairing these techniques has been really handy because it just kind of gives us a way better understanding of what's going on. So here, we can take the increased expression in various metabolic pathways, and now we understand that there, the eggs and larvae raised in the light are breaking down more, uh, just even the process of breaking down cause, like need, causes you to need to burn energy. And so the fact that they're burning energy, and some of these are specifically related to uptake of you know, fatty acids, which is what their yolk sac is made out of, um, this kind of starts to give us an idea of why they're having smaller yolk sacs. And then that also could perhaps explain why we saw an increased mortality as well. So pairing these understandings has been really helpful to kind of confirm our initial theories um, to an extent. Another way is that we can use some of these genes to, um, we could use them as markers. So while we reared these eggs in experimental treatments, if you, for example, use Matt and Ellen's egg pumping device and you sample some eggs from under the ice, and you know that there was ice there when you're sampling, obviously, but perhaps I, light, um, ice took a while to come on and then it melted off pretty early, you want to understand if the eggs or the larvae that you sample have any, any negative impacts of light, you can possibly use the BBRA gene and see what level of expression or if it's differentially expressed in perhaps in um, a bay that had 100% ice coverage versus a bay that had more sporadic ice coverage, for example. Another thing is that this, this pilot study has shown that focusing on not only temperature but other environmental factors such as light is important because temperature definitely is a, a direct, it's something that people automatically think about when they think of climate change, but there's a lot of other effects of climate change and light is definitely one that wor is worth further investigation. And then finally, we were able to kind of filter climate change down into this more specific idea of light and but because we did so in a way that 